In my last video, I showed you how this new Craftsman Brushless Impact from Lowe's performs. If you missed that, there's a link in the description. Today, we're going to tear this impact apart and see how it's made. And that may give us some hints whether this is related to the DeWalt Brushless Impact that looks pretty similar. Both brands are owned by Stanley Black & Decker. Let's start with the source of its power, the battery pack. If you remember from before, the pack is assembled in China with cells made in Korea. So my guess is we're going to find LG or Samsung cells in here. I think I got them all, so let's open this up. Here we actually have the pack of cells. You can see the cells there on the bottom, all the control circuitry on the top. The way this is set up, we can't see much of what is on the control board because a lot of it's uh, on the other side. We do know that this does have a uh, temperature protection circuit because if you remember in my last video when I got it really hot from putting it through a big test uh, and I put it in the charger, it knew it was pretty hot and wouldn't charge it until it cooled down. Either the manufacturer did not put their name on the cells when they supplied them to Stanley Black & Decker, or they just happen to all be positioned in a way that we can't read the name. But I think that they may not be marked. And I can see uh, some numbers and letters here. So let me do a little Googling and see if I can uh, use that to figure out who made these cells. I'm a little surprised to say my research here has come up empty-handed. None of the markings I can see give any indication who actually made these cells. The color of the outer jacket here looks really similar to one that Samsung uses, but we can't just go on that and guess that they're made by Samsung. So I'm gonna put all the markings on the screen here, and if any of you recognize them and know who made these cells, well, let me know in the comments down below. Here's something on these battery packs that I do not love. Just feeling the case here, it's clear that this is an inferior plastic to what they actually use on the rest of the impact. The texture and the way it feels, you can just tell it's brittle and it's flimsy and it's cheap. And that is because, can we see it in here? Yeah, they used cheap ABS plastic for the housing of the battery pack. Why did they do that when they use something better on the rest of the impact? I don't know. But what this means is, let's say you were to drop the impact, you're gonna be more likely to break this brittle ABS case for the battery pack than you're gonna be to break the actual housing to the impact. Of course, there are a lot of variables, you know, how you drop it, how far you drop it. But in general, the plastic here on the battery case is going to be more brittle and more breakable than the plastic in the rest of the impact. I'm recording this the day after Thanksgiving, so it's only appropriate to say it's time to carve this turkey. Looking at the case here, and as far as the cosmetics go, they did not skimp on the details here. We can see this is a very detailed molding, and check out the over molding. Look at all the detail work they put into that. This is obviously just cosmetic, but it shows they did not cut costs when it came to detail work like this. Looking at the inside here, and again, a very detailed molding, and everything looks good. We can see here PA6 GF30, so nylon with 30% glass fibers. That's a normal material to use in a tool like this, and they used plenty of it. It's a sturdy, stiff piece. Nothing wrong with this except for one assembly problem. Look down here, do you see that little stud there? Uh, it looks like when they were putting this together, this got caught on something and got bent over here. So they were putting the two halves of the clamshell together. This got hooked on something and instead of figuring out what it was, they just jammed it together and uh, bent that over. I'm going to uh, probably just break that off before I reassemble this. Another thing I noticed on this, typically on a tool like this with the overmolding, you'd see multiple little black dots in the field here, and those would be anchor points for the overmolding where it flows through and that helps hold it in place. But they did something differently on this, which is kind of interesting. Let's see if I can really get in there. See, they basically have little dovetail joints in the plastic case here, 
and the overmolding flows into that and locks it in and holds it in place. That is an ingenious design and it's interesting to see that. Let's start looking at the electronics here and right off the bat, I see something that I like. We have a circuit board here that's part of the whole trigger assembly and there are two different materials being used here. And they're both white, so it's kind of hard to tell they're using two different ones. But we have a harder adhesive here, which is being used as a reinforcement. So what this is doing is reinforcing these connections. For example, where these wires attach, and down here, these two capacitors, just reinforcing them so that vibration is much less likely to shake something loose and damage it. The other thing we see here is a uh, rubbery, white white material used to cover the whole circuit board, and this is serving basically as a conformal coating. What that does is it helps seal the whole assembly to keep out, for example, moisture and prevent that from damaging the circuit board. So these are two nice steps that I'm glad to see they included, and they could have saved some money by skipping these. We should just be able to pull the entire impacting an electronics assembly out as one piece like this. Pull this rubber boot and the lights off the front here. See how that's put together. They have the three LEDs as part of this ring that's wired in here to the main switch, which is effectively serving as the brain box. The whole uh, circuitry and switch is all integrated here into one unit. Here on the actual hammer and down inside the hammer case, there is plenty of uh, dark molly grease. So this is well lubricated from the factory. Here's the brushless motor out of the Craftsman Impact. And for comparison here, I have the armature out of an old angle grinder I burned up. This is out of a brushed AC motor, but it'll still basically give you the gist of the differences between a brushed and a brushless motor. On a traditional brush motor, you have brushes here riding on the commutator of the armature. That allows electricity to energize the windings on the armature, which creates a magnetic field, and that interacts with the magnetic field in the stator, which causes the armature to spin. On a brushless motor like this, the rotor has fixed magnets, and to make it spin, the computer is controlling the magnetic fields by energizing these coils in a sequence and that causes the rotor to spin and controls the speed. In a brushed motor, the brushes riding on the commutator creates friction and heat, so by getting rid of those in a brushless motor, you're increasing efficiency, which translates in the real world to more power and longer battery life. Looking at the stator here, all the coils are nicely wound and all the laminations are cleanly cut and stacked. Everything on this looks good. On the rotor itself, the laminations also look good. We have a teeny tiny ball bearing here. Uh, hopefully that will focus on there. This is a sealed bearing, which is good to see. That'll help keep any contamination from getting in there and damaging it. And we can see that this is a made in China bearing. It is CW brand. CW is a Chinese company, but uh, it's one of the more reputable ones. This tool is assembled in the USA. Like I said in my last video, if you do some searching on YouTube, you can see uh, DeWalt factories, DeWalt is also owned by Stanley, uh, even winding motors in the USA. Was this one wound in the USA? Well, I don't know. The fact that it has a Chinese bearing here that could indicate the whole motor was made in China, or it could be that the motor was assembled in the USA and they just sourced bearings from China. One of the main downsides of a brushless electric motor is all the electronics you need to control it, and that equals cost. There's another little circuit board in here that I forgot to show you that includes some sensors that monitor the rotation of the rotor, and uh, that board also had a conformal coating, which is good to see. I was just checking out the connection here. These are the stakes that go into the battery and actually transmit the electricity. We can uh, see here the wiring. They use heat shrink tubing, which is good to see. Here at the connection, it's a nice solid connection, but it's not exactly soldered. It looks like what they did is they uh, took a piece of a solder or similar material there. They applied heat to the back side, almost like spot welding, and that's how they connected the stake to the wiring. With the way this is set up, 
Unfortunately, there's not much more for me to show you without totally destroying this switch assembly, which I don't want to do because I did buy this with my own money. Now let's take a look at the real heart of this thing, the impacting mechanism. Here we have the hammer, and the way this works is these two tabs actually impact on these two ears, which are on the back side of the drive. And that's how you transmit the torque from the motor through this impacting assembly into the drive itself. But it's not just as simple as that. The way this works, you can see it's spring-loaded. So as it's impacting, it's spring-loaded on those ears. But also, it's gonna be hard to show this. If you twist it, the hammer goes back and down into the impacting mechanism. And look at those ears down in there. See those scrape marks on the ears? That's because uh, as this is impacting, this can uh, retract down in there, skip over those ears, then build up some momentum before it impacts again. Checking out how this thing is made, the actual hammer itself looks very nicely done. Typically, I would expect something like this to be forged, but I don't see any, you know, really obvious forging marks. It sure looks like it's been tumbled and it's obviously been machined here in a few spots. So they could have cleaned off the forging marks, or it might be that they're using a different process to make this. These two gears here are obviously powdered metal gears. We have a bearing to support it here at the back. Unfortunately, uh, no brand name that I can see on that. And uh, these two gears fit into this big ring gear here, and that supports it as the motor is turning the impacting assembly. I should also note, I cleaned all the grease off of this so you could see it more clearly. It was well lubricated from the factory. The gear case itself is cast, either aluminum or zinc, something like that. Then there's some machine work done and it is painted. Everything on this looks good. On the back of the hammer assembly here, these two gears ride in this ring gear on the front of the motor case. This is a powdered metal part. Think about how much work it would take to machine this the old fashioned way. That's why you see companies using powdered metal parts in situations like this. We have the splined shaft coming out of the motor here. That is what actually engages these gears and turns the hammer mechanism. We also have this O-ring here, which helps keep the grease in the hammer case where it belongs. Here's a picture I took of the switch and motor assembly out of my Craftsman Impact. And here I have a picture of the same part out of the DeWalt DCF887. Uh, notice any similarities there? In my opinion, they look nearly identical. The only significant difference I can see are the battery mounts are different. And I think that's because the batteries are not interchangeable. The similarities are not a huge surprise because Stanley Black & Decker owns both DeWalt and Craftsman. Of course, there could be some differences here we can't see, like programming that may play a part in the Craftsman having a little less torque. But yeah, it sure looks like the Craftsman is based on the DeWalt. The hammer assembly here is another place where the Craftsman and the DeWalt look almost identical. Looking at pictures online, it looked like the DeWalt might use a little bit heavier spring here in the hammer mechanism. If they do, that could be one of the reasons the DeWalt is rated a little higher when it comes to torque. Let's take a look at the size of this thing. There are lots of impact drivers that are way bulkier than this Craftsman impact, which is pretty compact at five and a half inches deep. I did check out some major brands on display at local stores and I measured them. I found the Craftsman is in line with some and is a little bulkier than some others. So as we just saw, the DeWalt is a little more compact front to back than the Craftsman here. But looking inside the case, it sure looks to me like they could redesign this a little bit and make the Craftsman a little more compact as well. Just a wild guess here, but my guess is maybe this has to do with marketing. DeWalt is Stanley Black & Decker's top of the line professional brand, so it has to be the best in all categories. They can't have the Craftsman here, a lowly consumer brand, uh, be equally compact. On my last video, I had several people say that this brushless impact is now on sale as part of a combo for 99 bucks, but that's not correct. 
So this is the kit that's on sale right now for 99 bucks, and it includes this impact wrench. So this impact is brushed, it's not brushless. Uh, it's clearly bulkier than the brushless impact here. It's not built in the USA, and it's less powerful than the brushless impact. So it's just simply not the same as the brushless model. So overall, I gotta say, this thing looks good. It would be nice to see name brand bearings in the motor, like SKF or something, but they did at least use bearings from a reputable brand. And it would also be nice to see a name brand on the battery cells, just so we could know for sure what we're getting. We also saw that this looks very closely related to the DeWalt Impact. They may have made some tweaks here on the Craftsman to make it a little less powerful, but boy, to me, it sure looks like you're getting DeWalt guts in a Craftsman package here. So, should you buy this Craftsman Impact? Well, it did recently drop in price, which makes it a pretty good deal. I've seen some people ask why you would want to buy this Craftsman and not just get a DeWalt. As I explained in my last video, it does look like the Craftsman may have longer warranty coverage on the battery. If you want to know more about that, check out my last video on this Impact. So what do you think? Is this Craftsman Impact worth 150 bucks, which is what they're asking for it right now? Let me know in the comments below. And while you're down there, hit that subscribe button and that like button. And thanks for watching. Some of you were downright mad that I fast forwarded through the performance testing in the last video to save time. For you all, here you go at regular speed.